Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Guillaume Piget, I'm the Artistic Director of Theatre and this evening we are going to be talking about Etienne de Croo and Corporal Mime. This talk is going to be about 40 minutes long and there will be a short Q&A afterwards. Before we start, it's important to say that I have never met, nor trained, nor worked with Etienne de Croo directly. My journey with Corporal Mime and the work of de Croo started with Daniel Stein in the US in 2005. I was later able to train with Dean Fogel in Canada and then with Thomas Labart in France and then with Stephen Wasson and Corinne Soum here in the UK up until 2010. For the past 10 years, Corporal Mime has been at the centre of my practice both in terms of making work and training actors. So, this seminar is very much going to be about what I find deeply inspiring within the Cruz life and work, and how it is enabling me to create my own work with theatre. We will first look at who is Etienne de Croo and where he sits within the theatre ecology of the 20th century. We will then look at Corporal Mime and try to get an understanding of what it means, where it comes from, and what are some of its key principles. Finally, we will conclude by discussing why we should talk about Etienne de Croo and his work within the context of actor training and contemporary theatre making. So to begin with, a little bit about Etienne de Croo himself. There are numerous books, articles and journals um, about de Croo, mainly from Thomas Labart, but also from other former assistants and students. I would highly encourage you to read every single one of them. I would also encourage you to read de Croo's book, Words on Mime. These books have been instrumental in forging my understanding of Corporal Mime and its legacy. They also have been instrumental in the writing of this talk. Let me start with a short biography of Etienne de Croo. De Croo was born in July 1898 in Paris. De Croo then enters Jacques Copeau's School of Theatre, known as the Vieux Colombier, at the age of 25 in 1923. He leaves Copeau in 25 and became a professional actor, working with Gaston Batty, Louis Jouvet, Anton Artaud and Charles Dunin. He earned his living from the theatre and he had about 60 roles on stage. He also earned his living from making films and he did about 20 films. Um, originally, he developed Corporal Mime in his spare time. De Croo frequented the anarchist milieu up until 1929. He formed his own theatre troupe in 1931 and started presenting, presenting work such as Primitive Life, Medieval Life, Industrial Life, Ancient Combat, The Carpenter and The Washerwoman. In 1938, De Croo performed a hundred times in his dining room for audiences of two or three. In 1939, De Croo seized all overtly political activity, Corporal Mime becoming his political party. In 1941, De Croo opened his school and presented pieces such as Camping and Passage of Men on Earth. In 1945, De Croo and his company performed at La Maison de la Chimie in Paris. Edward Gordon Gregg, whom we'll talk about a bit more in depth later, uh, was the guest of honour and he reviewed the performance by saying of De Croo, at last, a creator in the theatre, of the theatre. This placed De Croo at the forefront of post-war European work. In 1946, De Croo and his company performed pieces such as The Factory, The Trees, The Mischievous Spirit, Little Soldiers, Making Contact, Checkers and Party. From 1957 to 1962, De Croo teaches in New York City. He also performed a solo lecture, le lecture demonstration and taught workshops at various universities in the US. In 1963, De Croo publishes a book, Words on Mime. And from 1962 to 1986, De Croo teaches in his basement in Paris. De Croo dies in 1991 at the age of 93. So again, this is a very short and very selective biography. Um, I have now gathered here a few elements that I think are important to take away at this stage and within the context of this talk. 
The first, the first element is that de Croo's work spanned the entire 20th century. Now that's quite special and rare. And what is even more rare is that a lot of his work has survived. De Croo has, has had many assistants throughout his life, and most of them kept the pieces, the figures, the études, and the walks alive. Um, and they were in turn able to pass these on to people like myself. This longevity has allowed us to see that the work has constantly been evolving, changing and transforming with him during his lifetime and with his assistance. The carpenter of 1931 is very different um, from the carpenter in 1980. This has led to the construction of a modern and a postmodern repertoire. De Croo comes from a working class background. He had several jobs in his youth. He was a butcher, a dishwasher, a painter, a plumber, a mason, a roofer, a nurse. He also spent three years in military service. He was used to work with his hands, to do things and be physically active. De Croo was a professional actor, not a director like other famous figures such as Coppola, Stanislavski or even Meyerhold. De Croo was a creator and, and I made a point of naming some of these pieces just now in the short biography. This is extremely important. It is from the making of work that he started to articulate a movement language, a technique and a vocabulary, an art form, not the other way around. De Croo was a pedagogue, an actor's trainer, an actor's teacher. He ran a school from 1941 to 1986, 45 years in total. Not unlike Grotowski, De Croo had a very specific relationship with the audience, with more often than not limited audience members in unconventional spaces. The last point in De Croo's life that I feel is relevant here is that he was really interested in politics. He was a militant and anarchist. He actually, originally, joined the Vieux Colombier in Paris to become a better political speaker. What he discovered at the Vieux Colombier under Jacques Copeau was very different. Now, very briefly about Jacques Copeau. Jacques Copeau was a French theatre director who had a major influence on French and international theatre at the beginning of the 20th century. Coppola's values were classicis, classism, classicism of form and of thought. His nephew and student, Michel Saint-Denis, was instrumental in the spread of Coppola's ideas here in the UK and in the United States. In 1935, Saint-Denis founded the London Theatre Studio and after the war, the Old Vic Theatre School. Saint-Denis directed productions by the Royal Shakespeare Company with actors such as John Gilgood and Laurence Olivier. I am mentioning these names so you can see the extent of Coppola's influence and how we're still today following his ideas. Coppola's training for actors was putting the emphasis on movement, improvisation, being able to respond to the real world as well as internal impulses. It was repressing facial expression in favour of larger physical expression. It was advocating for an economy of movement that comes from really doing something. And this already reminds us of De Croo's experience of real manual labour. For Coppola, the quality that had to be developed in an actor were simplicity, austerity, clarity, articulatedness and gravity. Coppola famously wanted a bare stage, un tréteau nu. Now, none of this is foreign to Coppola and mine. There is a clear lineage with Coppola. However, De Croo goes even further. He not only wants a bare stage, but he wants a nearly nude actor on that bare stage. De Croo's Paul Mime also shares some similarities with Edward Gordon Gregg's vision. Again, a little, a little bit about Edward Gordon Gregg. Um, he was a British scenographer, director and theoretician who influenced the development of theatre in the 20th century. He devised his own revolutionary approach to movable architectural staging and he is at the origin of the concept of the super marionette. Craig's will to liberate the theatre from sentimentality and new realism, Craig's idea that style and symbols are essential to art, that actors should train, and most importantly that actors must not allow other artists 
to colonize the theater are all very, very, very close to corporal mime as well. Again, a nearly nude actor on a bare stage. No lights, no costumes, no props, just the actor's body. We can also find references to De Croo in Antonin Artaud's writings. Here again, a little bit about Artaud. Um, Artaud was a French poet and a theatre director, widely recognised as one of the major figures of, the, of, of, of 20th century theatre and, and the European avant-garde. Artaud's description, for instance, of his poetry of space is very similar to Corporal Mime, with elements of cubism, surrealism, collage, abstract expressionism. Both Artaud and De Croo challenged the playwright's centrality in the development of work, in the development of new work. However, despite the influence of these ideas coming from Copeau, Artaud, Craig, uh, none of them left a legacy of corporal teachings. And that is the strength of the Cruz Corporal Mime. There is, just like in ballet, a repertoire, a vocabulary and a technique. So that leads me to the second part of this talk where we will discuss Corporal Mime itself. So the main question, what does it mean? I hear you ask. Well, let's start with a quote from De Croo, and hopefully things will become clearer. De Croo says, For an art to be, the idea of one thing must be given by another thing. I'll just repeat it one more time. For an art to be, the idea of one thing must be given by another thing. So following that reasoning, the art of mime is about making the portrait of one thing, an idea, an emotion, a mental attitude, with another thing, your body, an object, voice, the use of space, etc. Therefore, corporal mime is about making the portrait of one thing with the body. Now, what does it mean to make the portrait, to make the portrait of? It means evocation rather than depiction, reproduction, or even representation. You can see here that corporal mime steers well away from storytelling and obvious narrative. It has absolutely nothing to do with the cliché, old-fashioned pantomime that seems to be prevalent in everyone's imagination when the word mime is mentioned. As a side note, it's, it's important to say that the cathedral of corporal mime, as Etienne de Croo would refer to it, was never intended to complement another art form, such as literature, for instance, or even theatre itself, but to stand on its own. This is important because it is potentially one of the main differences with other corporal teachings, such as Meyerhold's biomechanics. Well, now that we know what corporal mind means, the question is, where does it come from? De Croo did not see himself as the inventor of corporal mime. He saw himself, in his own words, as a furniture mover. The idea is to take principles from various places, poetry, everyday life, manual labour, literally everything, and apply them to mime, to observe and then to move. He claimed that he did not invent anything but the belief in these things. For him, everything already existed in life. The only thing he did was to move these things into the studio, to take them apart, to study them, to find out their essence and their rules so they could be used in mime, so they could be used as tools for expression, ways of expressing yourself, ways of communication. As you can see, little by little, we're diving into the realm of stylization. So what does it mean to stylize and why? Why do we bother? Why should we bother? Well, here's another quote from De Croo, which might help us out. De Croo says, The abstract is the flower of the concrete. Again, the abstract is the flower of the concrete. The concrete here is a real action. The corporal mime does. The, the, sorry, the corporal mime does not pretend to do something. The corporal mime does reactions. The process of stylization is what will allow us to get to the abstraction from the real action. So to stylize an action means to allow the whole body to offer a logical, coherent, 
honest and authentic response by following the line of force suggested by the real action. Stylization allows a real action to blossom. But how does it work? What are the tools? Very good questions. The comparison to music here is really useful. In music, spontaneity and discipline, or craft, mutually reinforce each other. Similarly, corporal mind is a highly structured language that permits and even calls for spontaneity. And here are a few key corporal mind principles. The first one of them is the notion of articulation. The crew reimagined the human body in a musically analytical way, breaking it down into a keyboard that could, he hoped, play any melody the actor imagined. The body becomes an instrument, and the actor becomes the instrumentalist of their own body. Trying to summarize everything here would be impossible and probably quite useless. First of all, there is too much. And second of all, corporal mime is the sort of thing that you do rather than talk about. But here are a few things to give you an idea of how it all works. Remember that keyboard analogy that I just mentioned. The human body is broken down into segments. The head, the neck, the chest, the waist, the hips, and then the legs and the feet. Each segment can move in different directions. These directions are rotation, yes, rotation, we can all do that, inclination, left and right, and depth, up and down. Every time something moves, the aim is to reach 1-8. Now, what is 1-8? If you imagine a circle, half a circle would be half a circle, right? And if you ask for half of that half circle, that would be a quarter, and half of that quarter would be 1-8. So that's the 8 that you're looking for. The 8 is our limit. It doesn't mean that from now on we should only move um, in 8. No, but the aid gives us a limit, a point of reference. We can do more and we can do less, but at least we know. Also, everyone can reach the aid. So in corporal mime, it's not about how stretched or how strong you are, but it is about how equal you can be with every part of your body. This is really important because it means that everyone can do it. There is no special predisposition or talent required. It's just about work. If you work hard, you will get it. As a side note, this reminds me that one did not need to audition to enter the crew school. Everyone was welcome, and it was notoriously not expensive to train. So the difficulty was not to enter. The difficulty was to stay. Now, back to, to, to the notion of articulation. The combination of inclination, depth and rotation leads to the constructions of what we call triple designs. There are eight triple designs, four on the right and then four on the left. Yeah. Let's have a look at an example and let's see what a triple design of the head in right and right back looks like. So you start with a rotation, one eight to the right, boom. Right. So that's one eight, rotation to the right. And then you add the inclination, boom, one, in, one eight to the right, right? You could have gone to the left, but we're going to the right and then back, boom, right? And we could have gone forward, but we're going to the back, right? And that is a right, right, back, triple design, right, right, back. And you come back three, two, one, you're back home. You could also have gone in left, left, forward. So left, left, forward and three, two, one. You can also obviously not just do it with the head. You can also do it with the bus. So the bus rotates right and then inclination, right and then back boom and then three two one right and you can do it with the trunk you can do it with the eiffel tower you can do it with every single segment um now where am i yes we've done it with the bust again i would like to stress that the crew did not invent triple designs um we leave our lives in triple designs um, let me give you another example. Um, this evening, after the discussion, when I, uh, when I, you know, I will, I will want some dinner, I will be standing in, in front of my fridge and I'll be thinking, what is it that I'm going to have for dinner? Well, maybe I'll have um, potatoes. Yeah, maybe potatoes. Well, actually, I had potatoes yesterday, so maybe I'll have 
Uh, lentils. Yes. And then with my lentils, I add some carrots. And yeah, I think I'm sorted. Right? And I'm back home. So you see here, I was just thinking about what I was going to have for dinner. And in the process of thinking of what I was going to have for dinner, I went through several triple designs of the head. I went through right, right, back. I went through left, left, forward. I had left, right, forward. Then I went all the way to right, right, back. And then I slowly came back home um, straight, in from, straight in front of me. Um, I got lost again in all my pieces of paper. Here we are. So you see, <laughs> triple designs are everywhere. And I would actually encourage you to pay more attention to the statues, the images um, that you see on a daily basis. Try, try to recognize these, these, try to recognize these, these designs and you'll see that they are everywhere. Um, moving away from triple designs, we can also organize these various segments in, in, in different ways. Um, so let's have a look at um, the different ways of organizing these, segment, these segments on a lateral plane. So let's, let's have a look at what happens when I'm adding one thing on top of the other. This is called an annulet, and I have an inclination of my head, one eight to the right, and then I'm adding the bust, right? So I have my chest, sorry, the chest plus the head, right? And they, they come together, right? So that, that would be an annulet. We've got the contradiction, so it would be head to the right, boom, chest to the left, boom, and the head is in contradiction, right? The head is clearly going to the right, and my bust is clearly inclining to the left, so there is a contradiction. The last possible scenario is you've got an inclination of your head to the right, boom, and then the chest re-establishes underneath, re underneath your head, right? So annually, contradiction, and re-establishment. These are the three ways of organizing all these segments um, and of course we're doing it on the lateral plane but of course it's it, it can also happen on our uh, in triple designs and we could go on like that for a very very long time um, it's very rich what I would like you to see is not so much that corporal mime is difficult or even technical of course it's difficult if it was easy no one would want to do it what I would like you to see though is that it is very similar to music like for musician, the, the musicians, the aim is not to be working towards the ability to do scales and displaying technique. The aim is to be able to communicate something else through the technique, something else through the craft. When you listen to a violinist playing, you listen to the music. You don't spend the entire time thinking, oh God, that must have been, <laughs> that must have taken a long time and a lot of effort. Also, I don't know anyone in the world who is not touched in some way or another by music, despite the fact that it's extremely technical. But back to articulation. It's important to mention that corporal mind focuses on the trunk, the largest part of the body, and not so much on facial expressions, the arms and hands. The two main ideas behind this choice is that we are very good at lying with our face and hands. It is a lot more difficult to lie with the trunk, simply because your whole weight is engaged. Engaged. The other idea is that the face, the arms and the hands are not a motor for actions. They follow the actions. This notion of articulation extends to rhythm. De Croo called them dynamo rhythms. Dynamo rhythms refer to the speed, the weight and the trajectory of the movement. They are based on the necessities of real actions. For instance, a muscular vibration comes out of the necessity to overcome what needs to be overcome. If I'm, if I'm lifting something that is above my head, I will have a muscular vibration in my biceps because I'm trying to overcome something that is, um, that is up there. Now, this is the opportunity to talk about the vocabulary in corporal mind where the name of the things refer both to the action and how to do the action. Let's take an example. Um, let's take the example of another dynamo rhythm called snail antenna. With a snail antenna, the aim is to approach very slowly without any static accent and then to have a sudden retreat. So it goes like this. You go slowly towards something and then you go away suddenly. 
The crew could have called it the sudden retreat, but he didn't. The snail antenna immediately gives the image of the most fragile thing on Earth, venturing out into the world and then encountering or sensing a danger. This equips the dynamo rhythm with a quality that only the imagination could bring and that a dry description could never match. The specificity of the vocabulary allows the action the action to go beyond the technicalities of the movement. So you see, it's always about going beyond the technique. Dynamo rhythms are crucial in ensuring that everything the corporal mime does is dramatic. Nothing, nothing in life is without rhythm. The absence of rhythm is the absence of life. Dynamo rhythms are in charge of the dramatic flow in corporal mime pieces. This opens the door to a different kind of dramaturgy, a dramaturgy that would function through causalities, how dynamo rhythm connect, dynamo rhythms connect with each other, which is very different from a classic narrative or even a plot. The crew also looked at the articulation of space and the articulation of weight. One guiding principle is that if everything move, moves, nothing moves, hence the need for articulation the need to divide, to stop, and to change. So I think that's plenty for articulation here. Let's move, to, let's move on to the notion of counterweight. According to the crew, everything weights, and the enemy is the weight. This constant conflict with the weight, so in essence with gravity itself, is also one of the main sources of drama in corporal mime. And if you think about it, just the action of standing up can already be dramatic because you're fighting against the weight of gravity to come up. There is a struggle that needs to be overcome. We will elaborate on this a little later, but that struggle can become the metaphor for something else. You can also see here that unlike Circus performers, for instance, who do extraordinary things and make them look ordinary, the corporal mime does in the country ordinary things standing up and make them look extraordinary. The crew unraveled four ways to fight against the weight, and he called them counterweight, to counter the weight, to go against the weight. Again, these have not been invented by the crew. They are stylized versions of what we all do in life. They are stylized versions of real actions. In the training, one first learns how to deal, how to push, pull, pull um, uh, heavy weights. Then we learn how to deal with lighter weights and then imaginary weights, the weight of ideas, for instance. So we go from the physical world to the metaphysical world until the body becomes a metaphor, until the body becomes, until the body becomes a metaphor for the idea itself. And this is called mobile statuary. But here's one question though. What is the point of these tools? Why should we be moving away from the real action in the first place? In other words, what is the point of stylization? And the larger question, what is the point of corporal mime? We were hinting at this earlier. The point is to shift the focus from what the action is to how the action is performed. The how, through articulation and the use of counterweights, for instance, becomes the point of focus. The form becomes the content. And what's the point of that? Well, the idea is to do first, to start with actions and then to allow random unconscious movement to make connections. The idea is to not know what you're looking for until you've found it. The idea is to be in the position to start rehearsing a play before writing it. De Croo called this way of working the reverse metaphor. A metaphor is about taking an idea and grounding it into matter, like an object or an action or even a space to which is not linked to. And so, and, and, and this happens in order to express something that cannot be expressed directly. The reverse metaphor is the opposite. It is about looking at an object or an action and extract an idea from it. We can take away three leading principles from this. 
The first is that material actions suggest mental states. The second is that what is true in the physical world can also be true in the metaphysical world. And the third is that the corporal mind does not do what they do to do what they do, but they do it to do something else. To come back to our previous example of standing up, the corporal mind might not be standing up just to stand up, but to maybe, with the help of articulation and counterweight, make the portrait of humanity standing up. All three principles are encapsulated in this. The concrete action of standing up suggests an idea, humanity standing up, and then humanity stands up in the same way as someone would. So the rules that apply in the metaphysical world are the same as in the physical world. And then the corporal mind does not stand up because they want to stand up and, let's say, go to the bathroom. No, they stand up to do something else, to make the portrait of humanity standing up. Are you still with me? Let's look at another example. Let's imagine that you need to lift something really heavy. You will most likely use your legs. You're doing this, you're doing this to not hurt your back and use the strength in your legs. As mentioned before, the crew would, obs would observe that principle, which is something that we all do, and develop a study on that particular counterweight to find the essence of the action. In fact, what we're doing when we're using our legs is that we're placing the weight, our weight, underneath the weight that we want to lift. So we're, we, we we're using our weight against the weight of the heavy thing. This counterweight is called a cardeuse. Now, if what is true in the physical world is also true in the metaphysical world, then it means that an idea can be lifted with this can be lifted, sorry, with the same counterweight as a heavy object. So you'd be using that counterweight, the cardeuse, to lift a crowd, for instance. You'd be putting your weight underneath the weight of the, of the crowd and you'd be using a muscular vibration again and you'd be lifting the crowd. So it's about placing your weight underneath the weight of the crowd and then you'd be lifting the crowd, lifting the weight of the crowd. The viewer, the audience, will be able to access this metaphor or will be able, will be able to connect with the abstractions because it will strongly be rooted in a world that everyone can understand. Stylization is about enabling the real action to blossom. And that takes us back to the first quote by De Croo. The abstract is the flower of the concrete. The image of a kite is particularly useful here. No matter how far the kite flies, it is always attached to something that brings it back down to earth. And that, to me, is the beauty and the power of corporal mime. <clears throat> you can be as abstract as you like, and you can come up with the wildest metaphors. People, just because they are alive, will be able to access these metaphors. They will be able to recognize the essence of the real actions within the stylized actions. So that takes me to the conclusion of this short talk on Ducru and Corporal Mime. And it feels like we are a little bit more equipped to answer the following question. Why should we keep talking about Ducru and his work within the context of actor training and contemporary theatre making? Why is it important to keep the Corporal Mime repertoire alive and transmit it? Here is Ducru's answer. It was written at a, as a dedication to Thomas Labart in De Croo's Words on Mime in 1972. And Thomas Labart published, published it in his book entitled Etienne de Croo. De Croo says, one, one does not modernize a monument in order to conserve it. One must therefore conserve the body which was strong, skillful, ascetic. What will conserve it? Sport? is not one of the fine arts. One gives oneself to it only to vanquish others. Dance is not a portrait of struggle. Old-fashioned pantomime is not an art of the body. Corporal mime is more than a diversion. If it survives, the world will survive. 
It is quite common to hear that artists need to have something to say to the world before they start doing anything. I've always found this quite daunting and paralyzing. I've never had anything to say to the world, but I have always wanted to do things. And it is from the doing of these things that little by little I was able to communicate. Kopolmaim is a language that allowed me to develop an artistic taste, to find a voice and push the boundaries of my imagination as an actor, as a divisor and as a director. I am not interested in serving Corporal Mime as an aesthetic, and I don't think it needs me. The cathedral is built. People coming to see theatre shows do not come to see us with the idea that they're coming to see a Corporal Mime show. They're coming to see a piece of theatre. They're, they're coming to be moved and transformed in unexpected and extraordinary ways. Of course, the work is strongly rooted in Corporal Mime, but it is only to achieve something else something that goes beyond the medium itself. In terms of keeping the repertoire alive, it is important to remember that it is constantly evolving and changing. It has to, in order to stay alive. So it's not about transmitting some museum pieces, even though that would have its value too. But it is about enabling others to find their voice through corporal mime and keep pushing the boundaries of what theatre without a playwright can do. The only thing that the actor has to communicate with, without relying on anything else, is their body, including voice. The actor must become the instrumentalist of their own body. And everything they do, they do it as artists. They must transform nature rather than only expose their personal nature. Finally, there is a well-known French maxim that says, always present and invisible. Corporal mime must always be present and invisible. In other words, unnoticed. None of what we've just discussed should ever be seen on stage. Thank you very much.